rights um, to intellectual property, uh, which is probably something that, that many people here are in at this conference are interested in. Um, and to deliver this talk is uh, Aurelia, and he's from the University of Lund. So, please, look forward to Thank you. Oh, that's not. Um, so, I'm Aurelia, Aurelia Lukosiaricene, you don't have to know my surname. And today I will speak about human rights and IP. I am a lawyer, and therefore we get a PowerPoint presentation, and there will be no pictures in the PowerPoint presentation, just this one. So I'm sorry, that's how we do things. Um, I also come from a university, and I am a doctoral candidate there. Just for general information. So you write something very short, you know. Um, well, I think it was three years ago when I came to FSCONS last time, and I was a student, a master's student in the human rights, international human rights law program, and I was interested in the different applications of human rights in, in digital environments um, within the context of new technologies and things like that. And I found this this um, forward to be very interesting. Um, however, many people, and I, I also realize that many people do know things about human rights and they use human rights for many things. At least they speak about human rights. And human rights is becoming a new buzzword for, for not you maybe, but a buzzword for many things. You say, um, we want more freedom in that or in there, and we want freedom of expression, we want, you know, we have to protect our fundamental rights and things like that. And that is really good. Um, but as a lawyer, I felt that maybe it would be useful as well to know more about the content of human rights. So, but let's start, as, as you know, the ethos concept is about freedom. Um, the specific uh, year, the subtitle is semantics of freedom. And human rights in many different contexts have been used already by lawyers especially, but also other activists to ensure freedom of a human being. Freedom from the state, freedom from other individuals or from communities and societies, um, and freedom from business and companies, different influences. And of course, some, some things don't work ideally, but some things really do work. Um, and I think when we speak about freedom within the context of digital technology and digital society, we should use human rights as well. Um, now, I today will not talk about what you should do. You have heard so much now during this whole conference this weekend about what you should do or what would be the good ways to reach your aims. I will speak about a tool that you can use, a legal tool as a lawyer. You can use it in many different ways and I will try to elaborate on this a bit. But I just want to create this environment where we could discuss as well about how exactly these things, these, these tools can be used. Um, so now, um, you can use human rights in many ways, even within the internet. You can speak about privacy, for instance, because it's a really big topic um, in this conference and just in general. But I will not speak about that. Uh, you can ask me later why, <laughs> or uh, just not to expand too much. My specific topic is human rights and intellectual property law. And as you know, with many things, law is something that attaches itself or is inevitably related to things you are doing. The same thing is with you who work with software or media or whatever you work with. You probably realize that there is lots of legal issues that you have to be aware of. And intellectual property law, and specifically copyright that I will speak about today, is one of them. You can't, usually the, the promises, the technology, the new technologies are making, and the ideas of action that we are suggesting are much more limited in the actual usability of these things that the law permits to them. And copyright is one of the biggest problem, problems, uh, in my view, as a lawyer, uh, when it comes to law. Um, in the university, we have a master's program on national human rights law, as I said, and what we allow to our students now, and what we do, is we have a specialization of human rights and the property law. And there actually are quite interesting works that you can look into if you want um, about you know, how, how, different issues 
that are related to this topic. But so, um, that's complicated. I decided to start just a bit about what human rights are. Because as I said, you can speak about human rights from many different perspectives, but the real usability and the real power of human rights comes from the legal aspect of them. Because if you want to fight law, and usually that's what you want to do in whatever you do, um, you have to use law to do that. And human rights is a legal tool. That is very important. So as you know, there are many human rights. You know, right to life, right not to be tortured, freedom of expression, privacy, um, what not. And there are really many more. And they together as a bundle form kind of a um, collection of basic principles of which, uh, about what does it mean to be a human. Um, they are said to be essential expression of human dignity. And it sounds very fluffy, um, but you can use, well, now I, I will go uh, soon uh, on why this is important. So um, you probably know already, but I will still repeat myself a little bit, um, about, about how the human rights were invented. Uh, this happened after the Second World War. Human rights in the modern sense came in the form of universal operation of human rights. And why this happened was, of course, the atrocities of the Second World War. Um, you know, the, the Nazi uh, government, uh, which was, in essence, supported by the people within Germany, did horrible things. But the biggest problem uh, came after the war. Um, the question arose, what did really Nazis do wrong? Is it illegal? Anything that they did, is it really illegal? Because the, 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 the laws of that country at that time we believed a lot about sovereignty of the country. And the country can do whatever they want within their limits, and that's their business. The laws of the country did not prohibit what they did. And the laws of the country of Germany actually encouraged the things that they did. So how can we judge these actions? Is there any um, criteria to say that they're criminals? And at that time, there really weren't criteria to say that they're criminals, because there was nothing uh, outside the national law. Well, how it was decided then was that, of course, they lost the war, so, well, we can judge them. <laughs> and then, at that time, it was said that they basically violated the basic principles of humanity, which was nowhere enshrined or nowhere provided. No one knew what, what that means. But somehow the feeling was that, well, they did something wrong. Um, okay, um, after that, of course, in 1948, the idea came that we should codify these basic principles of humanity. We should say somewhere which, what, what those are. And that's how universal creation of human rights um, came into, into the light. And there are many human rights there. But as you know, declaration means just declaration. There is no, nothing binding in it. So after that, just to introduce you to the basic system, after that, few, well, decades after that, two covenants also were ado adapted, adopted. Um, by the international community. Um, so that means different countries signed uh, an agreement. So covenants, both are binding to the states which join them or which sign them. Actually, by now, when we speak about you know, 2000 and something, many uh, theorists, theorists um, agree that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is also um, now part of the international um, customary law, and is binding to all the countries of the world. What I mean now by binding is that every country, which is signatory or maybe in general, has to um, respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights and in these documents. And um, respect, protect, and fulfill are like, you know, the, the rules. So respect means do not interfere with the rights that the human has. Protect means do not allow other human beings or businesses or whatever to violate this right. Fulfill means take um, active actions to ensure the enjoyment of this right. Which is, again, important to understand. Because that's where the idea of doing it ourselves comes. As I said, the essence of the human rights is that the human rights are there to protect the subjects, the human beings, the individuals, 
from the state or other individuals or the structures. And this is something that everyone has about discrimination and, you know, uh, after birth. And, and you can use that. You should use that. This is not very, um, I mean, of course, there are many mechanisms now, but it's not like the states usually don't really like people to use their rights because it's not very, you know, convenient for them. Um, of course, you can complain, and there are international mechanisms, sort of international courts that you can go to and complain about your rights. I mean, now I'm speaking very general level, and there are so many regional systems and sub-regional systems and things like that, but just very general understanding of what human rights can give. They are legal instruments, some law which is outside the law, and no action or law within the country can violate these principles. Now, how it actually turns out is another question, but as an activist or as a person who wants to change something, you can argue and you can use human rights to try to do that. I mean, it doesn't matter maybe that um, you might not succeed the first time, but the more you use this language, um, the more successful you might become because the states do have obligations and they, do, uh, they are afraid that some claims will go to the court, <coughs> the national court. Of some kind. Um, now some specific human rights I want to speak about, which you can use in different aspects, and especially when it comes to copyright, but also other things related to digital technologies. Now you don't have to read all of this. This is just a text of right education that I took from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 26. Um, again, we use this right a lot. We say, you know, right education, we have to, you know, we should have it. But what does it really mean? And uh, what it means is, as you see in the text, education shall be free, generally available, and act equally accessible. And education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality, and, you know, and, and strengthening um, respect and, 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 and uh, maintenance of peace and things like that. I mean, there's lots of um, general statements. Uh, this right was also interpreted by the body that has the um, jurisdiction to interpret the right. Basically, that means the body said something that is also binding, that they said what the right means. Um, and additionally to these things, they also said that education has to be accessible, available, adaptable, and acceptable. We don't have to go too much into this. Um, all in all, what you should know is that every country has the duty to provide this. Provide free education at every level and increasingly introduce free secondary and higher education. Have appropriate facilities, have appropriate study materials accessible to children. The materials and study curricula have to be acceptable to the community um, and also have to be flexible and possible to change. Now immediately we see some things that you can use. One, one thing is you, you, you can argue, and, and I mean, the things that are happening now within education the, the fact that we have the old industrial society-based system where students are not really developed for our society, not really developed for the future if you want, or um, they're not, um, yeah, well, the full realization of human um, potential is not reached. I mean, we can speak in very vague terms, but we can speak in, in particular terms. This you can use actually to change the curricula, to introduce more technology-based learning, or more uh, discussion, group work, or whatever-based learning. I mean, you, you, can, you can put your content there. Um, also, when it comes to open source software within schools, you can, you can definitely use that. Um, because it says that, that facilities have to be flexible and possible to change. Um, and the curriculum has to be acceptable. I mean, what else? You have so many, you have so many schools which use this, this um, software, the software that they can't do anything with really, and they're not really useful and not really flexible. And you know, um, after all, this this first part as well that education has to be free. You you don't. I mean, of course, it's free for our children, kind of. But uh, we pay lots of money to the taxpayers uh, through our taxes, and um, we that's that's a huge cost. And the more free we make it, the the better quality we can also suggest. And I mean. These are the things you can think about when it comes to copyright. Um, well, 
lots of the things here are related to study materials. And study materials is a huge luck, lucrative business. Again, we pay for these things through our taxes. And in general, that is not such a huge problem, problem maybe, in um, Switzerland or other European countries. But you see the real thing when you go to Asia or Africa. And then, then this is really a major cost. Educational materials are the major cost. And even with the, um, with the technologies that we have now and the, 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 the promise of, you know, um, open, well, of course, we have projects, we have open educational materials. But even, let's, let's just think about general projects where you have education online somewhere or, you know, um, some technology used in education is really hard with this general atmosphere of copyright, which, where you need permission for everything. In permission to copy, in permission to put the materials online, you need permission, you know, to do anything. This is a very, very complicated situation that many countries and many schools end up in. Plus, with many countries, um, when it comes to culture and language and things like that, you can't translate copyright material without really um, permission again. Not even to speak about rest education for visually impaired people, for instance. That is a big problem. Um, there are not, not enough educational materials. I mean, there's so much research on, on these things. Just just want to kind of introduce it very briefly. Um, when it comes to higher education, I mean, you are not you don't have duty to provide free education, but you have to introduce increasingly accessible and, and um, increasingly free higher education as well. I mean, we don't even have even have to speak about it. You probably all know that on well, Sweden universities space pay tens of thousands of euros for databases of articles and I mean this is a huge expense and um, the publishing companies do make profit from it and, and big profit and when it comes to poorer countries, I'm myself, I'm from Lithuania, um, I remember, well, it has changed a bit different now, but I remember when I was studying in Dash's degree, we had like one database with like, you know, 10, I'm a lawyer, so like 10 specific journals and Basically, you know, you have shortage of access because of the costs, and that is not okay. What I'm saying is that you can, you should know about it. I mean, you should know and be able to use these arguments. You know, expression. Um, again, all the rights, and all of them are in the universal place of human rights. I'm just taking text. One of the rights in the declaration, um, and also they are all in the covenants, so they are all compulsory as well. Just, you have to choose, and I'm choosing the general text. So, you know about this right, and this used so much, uh, especially in the context of um, digital technologies. You are free, you should be free, to seek and receive and impart information and ideas through any media, and regardless of, of frontiers. Well, um, and you know that this is not exactly true. I mean, this right, you can always say yes, you know, this, this, is, this can also be one of the arguments, actually, um, to uh, approve uh, file sharing. Just, just like that, you just say, you know, uh, well, we just are seeking and receiving information through media of our choice. It's not that simple in human rights. You usually, and also interpretation of this human right. This is a human right that has been there and used so much that it has been interpreted really a lot as well. And um, the courts have a different opinion, uh, even the human rights courts and national courts, about its usage. So basically, you need a balance, they say. And they say that, um, first of all, the copyright is used to protect this right as well. Well, the argument goes that um, without the copyright protection, first of all, when it comes to political speech, for instance, you would not be um, so daring or happy uh, to express yourself, because your words can be changed, first of all, and censored. Um, and second of all, when it comes to other expressions, you, sh you probably will not be so happy to um, create something if you don't get uh, protection or remuneration for it, and that's understandable. Um, so, in general, within this right, you already have this kind of idea of balance, uh, which does not allow you to use just like that, just say, like, okay, we are free and we do whatever we want. Um, but what you can, you can use it for, especially when it comes to copyright, you can use this argument of balance. It has to be there. So um, with, with new digital technologies, 
the balance shifts a bit because you have so many possibilities that if you are not allowed to use those possibilities, I mean, obviously, the copyright, for instance, is an a obstacle to use a lot of forms of expression and, and to express yourself and to receive information. I mean, that's obvious. So there's so many possibilities now that the balance does not is not reasonable anymore. You have, you know, you have all the rights, all the permissions um, within the hands of, of, of one or two people or whatever, you know, of, of a person, and you have so many possibilities that are pre prevented thereby. So, for instance, when it comes to copyright, the, 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 the term of protection of copyright, 70 years after the death of the author, it's really long. You can definitely say that this is disproportionate, that no one can use the work, no one can access the work, no one can receive this information um, for a very long time until this information becomes actually unusable and not interesting to anyone, probably. You know, it's like, what, 150 years? Nowadays, um, well, maybe sometimes less. Um, or uh, this, this, the same argument goes for remix and things like that. Um, when you have a form of expression, which is also a form of expression, the artistic expression, uh, or even expression, the political expression, if you use remix to kind of reflect on the cultural symbols of different kinds, um, you should be able to do that. And the copyright does not allow that, of course, because you have to ask permissions and, you know, um, things like that, well, it is really a, a true balance. And um, only by reading this text, you know, that the international law has actually some ideas that you can use, that a compulsory international law. Um, right to participate in cultural life. This, this right you probably don't know much about, it's not too much used or spoken about. Um, partly because the content is very vague. And it, up to 2009, it was not absolutely not clear what does it mean to take part in cultural life. Uh, the questions, of course, were, and now I'm quoting the covenant here, um, one of the compulsory documents which came from the US Federation, but basically because um, in the US Federation itself, Few rights are put in one article, and so I just use this, this expression is more clear. So, what does it mean, everyone? What does it mean to take part in what does it mean to cultural life? Before 2009, when this comment came out, which is also explaining this right, um, in, in, the, in, in the textbooks that uh, you read, for instance, you know, about human rights uh, from, from before that, you find the three understandings of cultural life. One of them is cultural heritage, or what this right could mean. One of them is, you, that could mean that you have right to take part in cultural heritage, or access cultural heritage. That means going to museums and, you know, looking at uh, sculptures and paintings and something. Um, that would, what would, could it mean? The second notion was that um, maybe this is the cultural life or cultural activities are the activities of the creative class of the creative individuals, of artists, and, you know, um, of course you can see the things um, they created somewhere in cinemas or concert, hall, concert halls or whatever, um, and access, that was access and then participation, I mean, of course, if you can participate, you can become an artist and do things. That's, that's okay, I guess, but you still have this distinction between this consumption and production. Uh, the third one that was also mentioned everywhere was, um, was this third very broad, very inclusive um, idea, the anthropological understanding, that culture is all manifestations of human existence. It's everything we do, starting from you know, arts and software and sports and, and anything we do, you know, cooking, because this is our culture, this is how we live, and this, this is what we experience. Um, and um, participation in, in this culture would, have, would mean something quite different. Oh yeah, oh, I have it here. Um, in 2009, actually, the committee that explained this right chose the third uh, notion. It said that it is a broad notion. It said that everything is culture. Everything we do is a culture according to this right. So basically, every country has to ensure that every subject in the country 
should be able to participate in, in, in you know, all aspects of their lives, because this is the full enjoying of being a human. Um, and they also explained what is participate in the context of the tribe. They said it's participation, access and contribution. So of course access is, is this more consumerist uh, idea that you have to know what's happening, you know, what others are doing, and, and, and be able to see things. But participation and contribution are these active, um, well I, I will not read now what exactly they said, are these active actions that you should be able to take. You should be able to form your own cultural identity. You should be able to have your own cultural communities. You should be able to react to the culture around you. I mean, this is pretty vague, but that's actually good. <laughs> well, because there are no case law, for instance, about this right yet. And it can be, the content can be added there. The, the, the explanation is very broad and very permissive. How I understand it, and how, how many people understand it, <coughs> is that the, this means that we should become not only consumers but producers of culture because this is what our um, technology but also our understanding about the world is today. And that's what human rights are for, to, to kind of embody this understanding of what is to be a human. And this is definitely something that can be used to advocate for many things. I mean, and as I said, you know, only to use this right, it's something that means you're referring to law. And that's, you know, that's strong. Um, the, this last right uh, I wanted to speak about uh, today is the right to moral material benefits from the works one and offer to. Well, basically, again, the text is over here, and you might not have heard about this right as well. And it's interesting, because also in the description of my talk, I spoke a bit about this balance, and what do human rights offer as a balance, maybe. And um, for some people, they don't, well, the ones who are more activists within the field of human rights, don't like this right that much. Because this is basically um, the embodiment of, of some kind of copyright within the human rights system. There are certain rights that an author should have. But um, in general, I mean, for any of us who create anything, you have this feeling that, uh, well, you should be able to have some kind of rights to it. Or maybe not. I mean, I don't know. It depends on what you feel. But uh, some kind of control or, 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 or benefits or something. So in fact, in the international human rights body uh, law, you have a right. So what it says is that everyone, well, the same basic, everyone has a right to benefit from the protection of the moral and material interest resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic production of which she is, or she, is the author. Um, so, two aspects. The human rights oblige the countries to take actions and ensure that everyone gets material benefits from their work. That is explained, again, there's explanation of this right, and this is explained as um, something that is related to another right, that is called right to adequate standard of living. It means everyone should be able to make living out of their work. Um, they should get some remuneration or some benefits. The second aspect is a moral, moral right, moral aspect. It consists of two rights. First of all, attribution. You have to be provided as a... Um, as the creator of the right, of the work, if you have created it. And the second one is um, your right to object to mutilation or change of your work that is um, against, that would be detrimental to your reputation. So basically, this kind of asserts the relation between the person who created the, the thing or creation of some kind with that work. And this is something that, you know, human rights do. They do this um, all the creation um, what does it mean to be a human thing, a human creativity thing. But what also the uh, committee said, that this right is not the same as the property. It's not the same as copyright. And this is said pretty explicitly. What the committee said that intellectual property law and copyright is one of the ways to ensure enjoyment of this right. But in fact, when we think about intellectual property law, it is much more than the human rights ask, in a way. Um, and the committee clearly said that, especially the material benefits 
they can be received by the artist not through the market regulated system, not for, through the copyright. It can be something else, it can be prices, it can be some support system or something else. I, mean, I don't know what that could be and they don't know that either. But it's important that it's not the same as it actually contributes more because, um, well, you can advocate for many things with the human rights um, without advocating for copyright. So here I think, well, and they, they say that intellectual rights are uh, limited in time and the human rights are not, and the human rights are very personal and intellectual rights can be assigned to someone else and um, that is um, incompatible with the human rights idea. So here I think uh, there is some kind of idea of, of a balance maybe. Uh, you should have some rights as a creator, but there is so much more to regulate the access of others within the human rights body. Um, and that is interesting and that's important. I think this is an approach that uh, sometimes is missing from discussions about the copyright or digital technologies. Okay, um, so what can you do with all this? As I said, you know, use for advocacy, whatever you, you need it for. Use it, your governments have responsibility, but that also means this, this thing to fulfill. That means they have to create policies to implement what not. Um, open access in schools, creative commons for their own, uh, the, the information they produce, uh, obligation to release everything that they fund through open licenses. That means arts that they fund, the science that they fund, because this is our money. They have to ensure that this right, these rights are fulfilled um, through, I mean, for everyone. Um, you know, and, and other, other governmental institutions, even universities, are actually, they control the government. They have the same the same duties, respect human rights, obviously. And even if there is if the institution is not governmental, the government has the duty to ensure that other institutions respect or respect your rights, even businesses. I mean, you can you can use it for any everything. Um, you can use it for uh, to refute the laws that are now, and you should do that. <laughs> um, of course, there's lots of political process in any change of the laws. The more, the more we use them, the more, the more you know, we, we give the message that we know our rights and we know the power that they have. Um, of course, another, another thing is the, the national litigation can go to the critical of human rights, you can go to these bodies of, uh, which are responsible for complaint handling for each of these covenants. That, of course, is a very expensive and very long procedure. Um, probably you will not do that, maybe that will, what will, lawyers will do. Uh, but you can do that, I mean, you can at least you know, realize that this, this thing exists. Um, well, and you can, of course, think about authors in a different way, um, which is also, I think, interesting and uh, important. Now, from what uh, I've heard already, there are two more things you can do. Um, what Smarty said, I think is also important, is that you should think about that yourself as well um, when you do what you do. You should think that you can create software which will be more inclusive, projects that you do, you know, how to integrate these things, how to, how to make sure people understand what's happening. Um, and then what the lady in the morning, Anna, said as well. Uh, human rights are a buzzword, and they're quite vague, some of them. Um, and you can fill them with content, and especially you can apply for funding for anything. If you use human rights, that's you know, important and good. Um, and some of them really allow for flexibility, a lot of it. Um, and you should use them, and should fill them with content. And usually that also helps to uh, get what you want. You say I'm working with human rights. Well, I hope you're all good in this room and not, do not use the human rights for bad things. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's, that's it, what I wanted to say. It's my email. Um, this is the logo of the university, uh, obviously. So, um, yeah, I think we have 10 minutes for questions. I, um, now I'm not exactly sure, 
I think when they speak about this free, um, there's probably no clarification what they would say. Now I speak about this comment that I explained right. Probably no clarification to say that free means money. But there's a lot of talk about you know how um, the expenses of the education is the main aspect of accessibility and blah 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 blah. Then, uh, that's that's a very good that's a very interesting uh, idea I think. Well, why not? You can you can try and I mean, for now it means money. Uh, most accept I mean, most people accept or think that it's money. But uh, maybe in your case, um, well, why not? You can say education has to be free in terms of legal. I mean, just free. <laughs> yeah. So I have a counter question in that case. Like, if it, is it really a difference between free? those two meanings of free in terms of the goal of the creation of knowledge. So the knowledge will be existing uh, regardless of whether the, the educational material has free, educational material is free or cost of free. Uh, yeah, but it could be used, I think, I don't know, like when I think about, of course, the cost is something, but when it comes to like uh, maybe that decentralization of some kind, or this idea that education has to be um, kind of grassroots, um, empowered by the people who are using it, kind of that that also could mean free in a sense that you can do whatever you want with, with you know this thing. Um, but maybe that's that's better for you to answer. I mean, you work with, with free, liberal, open source. I mean, software and what these things mean for you. That could actually be put into into that. Yeah. Well, in, in, in that case, uh, gratis, which is a word both in Norwegian, Swedish, and English, having the same semantics, uh, as far as I'm, I, uh, I'm aware, uh, is usually a, a byproduct of something being free as in freedom. I mean, if I download a uh, Creative Commons book uh, from the web, that's free as in freedom. Uh, yet, if I print this, it will cost me to print it, but the knowledge in it, what it represents, is still free. And whether I have made someone pay to get my printed version or something, it's not the, the knowledge contained within it, within it that they're paying for. It's, it's the, my printing, my work. So, so I'd say in, in that manner, gratis is a sub of the three. Mm. That probably goes, or you want to. Yeah. No, 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 I'll see you. So, no, I think that probably goes a bit with this idea of, for instance, that it's free for all children because we pay taxes, but is it free? In the sense of free. Because we have to pay someone to pay that. Um, yeah. But also, okay, yeah, I think that, that's interesting. So, in terms of education, like the material is one thing, but you won't get, you won't get far in the general educational situation with just material. Yeah, of course. But that's why it's very nice to have you know, all these elaborations about how education has to be development of human personality and transfer of values and blah, blah. It's not a lot, but it can be used to put things that we want to the table. question, but uh, how universally are actually adopted are those conventions? I know, for example, U.S. are sometimes supporting, but they are not, not signing some of them. Yeah. For example, these ones. Are they it's, it's pretty much universal. Like, there's always a discussion about how universal they're really, one of them is, for instance, the cultural relativity that we call it. The, uh, the, the developing countries, they say that they have not participated in this and they don't subscribe to that. Um, but many countries have adopted it. Yes, US is actually one of the like exceptions. They don't like things. They say our constitution is much more uh, advanced than any international human rights instruments. And they, they do say that. They have so many rights there and things like that. Um, but, um, you know, these things that I spoke about, they're very basic concepts. Um, now, the exact content is maybe not exactly the same. But these concepts, have, concepts exist in every, everywhere, almost everywhere. Um, some rights are a bit different, but I, so what I'm going to say is pretty universal. I know you can find the lists of the countries who have cited. It's pretty much all European countries, definitely, and I don't remember how many, but like really a lot of countries in the world. Some of them are like just falling out of the picture for some reason, but um, 
but it's usable. For practical terms, it's usable. And usually where it's not usable, there is a national constitution at least, which also embodies the same things as in the US. Or the US, uh, uh, they have this, uh, which the US has signed, I'm pretty sure, this uh, um, Inter-American Reservations Law. And they're pretty similar, all of them. Um, so you can check that out. But for practical terms, it's, it's, it's usable. Um, plus, what I said, it has not been any case law based on that, but lots of experts say that the Universal Declaration has become binding just because it's so fundamental that everyone has to be bound by it. Yes? Universal Declaration of Human Rights, how can, can it be affected? I mean, as in how it is worded or how it is written? Uh, is, uh, is, is there a, a, a governing body that oversees it in that sense? No, Universal Declaration has no... Basically, it's a declaration. It's very, very general and very broad. But these covenants, two covenants, are then binding, and that's why they have each a body which oversees their content, kind of explanation of the, of the content of their rights. So now I don't know what you mean by affected, but... Uh, mean, can it be altered, or altered? It can be altered theoretically if all the countries agree to that. But that's really... Um, I would more rely on this general possibility to interpret things. Especially because uh, the first sentence of, you know, of in the first declaration of any human rights and instrument, in fact, speaks about this human nature and what it means to be a human. And we can argue it has not really done, been done that successfully yet, but we can argue that this is what it means to be a human now. You know, we live in different times. And, and different rights, you have many comments, and it's just one comment for each right usually by these bodies, but they come like in five year intervals, so the most recent is what 2011. So that it, the, the perspective changes. As 2009, this, this cultural thing, the, the right to participate in cultural right, life, you can, really can see that it's very flexible and very, you know, inclusive. And the perspective changes as well. What does it mean to have this right? If, if 50 years ago, you probably would have a very different picture. So um, they can't be changed, but um, they can be interpreted. Yeah. How, how are these covenants affected by various political forces? I mean, how... Well, you know, probably this, this interpretation itself, because they, they, they will not be changed as well. You have to have agreement of all the states. The tradition itself definitely can be affected by forces, and definitely is. And like this statement that committee made, that it's not the same as intellectual property law. It's pretty um, brave in a way, and I, I'm even surprised that it was done. I mean, I don't know because it would have been so much easier for everyone. For everyone has money in the world that is that if they would have said that you know this intellectual property law is actually the same, and this is the right. Uh, that's what it means. And um, well, that was not done, and that is good. But yes, they definitely, I mean, now I'm not even sure how exactly they are, um, well, I can check it out, how exactly they are, um, how the members are appointed. But there is some kind of system which is pretty, like the member states appointed and blah, blah, blah. It's pretty political. Uh, so it's, it's like everywhere. It, it, there is a possibility, definitely. Um, but another thing is that, you know, <coughs> You can use them in many ways already. You don't have to change. I'm just, you know, saying that they're pretty usable already. So I saw two hands. It's Longman and it's uh, Lutz. I'm not sure who was first. But I think you know. I, I would be quick just to clarify yeah. over my own question. I just looked up this uh, covenant of civil and political rights. That was one of them. Yeah. So I, I asked about the US. So they have ratified it with several reservations. Okay. Well. And, uh, I hope not on these rights that we spoke about. <laughs> yeah. The other one they have signed, but they have not ratified. Yeah, the political rights. But that, that's not saying the U.S. is pretty much an exception because you can then see the list. You know, it's pretty long. It's, it's, it's quite the dossier. Yeah, there is a map here with oh. very few spots that are not. <laughs> yeah, signed. exactly. Uh, I just said there is a body that interprets the uh, the laws, right? Yeah. How is that set up democracy-wise? Who decides who goes on that? Let's, let's check. <laughs> no, because I really, I should have checked that, and I remember, I mean... Do you want to do that? 
another program. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know. Let's not check. Maybe you have one minute. Um, uh, well, uh, so I don't know. Actually, what are they called? The uh, International Committee of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and correspondingly, International Committee of Economic uh, of uh, uh, Civil and Political Rights. These two colonies, these two colonies. Right. So, if you just put um, basically this, it's International Covenant, but it's the same thing, and we can find it. The committee. Um, Oh, so, okay. so we can check. Um, it is politicized, I'm pretty sure. Um, but it, it, as I said, the results are pretty okay. As long as it remains very general and vague, I'm happy. <laughs> that means you can apply it in many ways. Yeah, yeah, I don't see that. Uh, yeah, because I know some Asian states have argued about cultural yeah. relativistic perspective. Yeah. No, I think now nowadays you have, uh, you know, that there are so many countries we have ratified it, and almost all of them. So you have different countries included. Usually the arguments goes a bit, they go a bit. They're not that much in the political level. Usually you have kind of all these perspectives that people have in different countries, and some countries don't want to comply with these rights, and, and you know they argue this. But so far, I don't know. I don't think. That in the in the committee, for instance, they have been arguing too much about, like, yeah, probably they do about the content itself, but not, like, what what does it should be complied with or not. Or it's more, yeah, it, it's it's considered to be quite universal. Yeah. There are all discussions, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So let's thank the speaker again. Okay.